Good morning. I would like to start this morning and dedicate our morning session to a very dear friend and colleague that was supposed to be with us and tragically couldn't do that. He's not with us anymore. Dr. Chesley Beaver, that was our dear friend and partner, passed away Sunday, very young age. He was passionately involved in the designing of the future vision of Echoes and Reflection, a project that Yad Vashem conduct together with the Shoah Foundation and with the ADL, the, the Anti-Defamation League. And uh, we all feel terribly sad and we'll all cherish his memory and remember him with a great love. So this is the time to continue. And to continue what uh, Yudha Bauer started, or as Rachel is teaching us, segued us from the historical evidence into the educational arena. And I would like to invite the participants of this session uh, to join me. On, and as they are climbing the stage, you are invited to look at the bio uh, booklets that you have. And uh, as we are arranging here on the stage, and I will skip then the introducing. But the four people joining me are Mr. Wolf Kaiser, Dr. Wolf Kaiser, Professor Michael Birnbaum, Professor Robert Wistrich, and my dear friend Shulamit. Are we ready? Okay, we are ready. Uh, as I said, on the stage, we have Dr. Wolf Kaiser, Dr. Michael Birnbaum, Shulamit, and Professor Wistricht. And we will try to arrange to, 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 to deal with this, uh, with the, to use this uh, uh, session in order to raise few of the challenges that yesterday were very broadly uh, put in front of us by Avner Shalev at the, at, the begin at the first session of the conference, and then appears here and there in the, in the following sessions and discussions. But today, the day will be dedicated to the questions, challenges, answers, and new, ch new, new questions concerning the implementation of Holocaust education in the different environments that we are coming from. Uh, our four guests will give us different point of views, different uh, 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 answers, or at least their answers to some of the questions, and maybe, probably, they will raise new questions that will go from here to the next sessions where we're going to, to share with each other our best practices, our experiences, and this, that, that, that will do, be done all day long. The first question I would like to raise, you know, education is always about being relevant and uh, meaningful. If there is no relevancy, 
it's hardly to believe that uh, the less, the, 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 what you've learned, the lesson will be kept and influence the student or the, for long. And the first question I would like to turn to the participant of this panel is whether it is possible at all to teach the Holocaust in a meaningful, relevant way. I would like everyone to answer within three to five minutes, and as it is the first statement that everyone is doing, I would appreciate if everyone would say what are the main relevant issues in his own eyes when he looks at the area of Holocaust education and foreseeing it for the next one, two, let's say one, two years. Don't be greedy. And I would like to start with Wolf. Please, Wolf. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I will uh, first say before I come to the content that I think uh, when we think of Holocaust education, we should not just think of youth. Uh, though the term education might be a bit strange in English when applied to adults, I think it is very important that we also address adults. It is a topic, topic for the whole society. Uh, concerning uh, the content of our teaching, uh, I think first we have to make clear the real dimensions of the Holocaust in terms of time and in terms of space. Uh, very often uh, the Holocaust is taught only centered on the countries where we live. Of course this is very important, but in order to understand what the Holocaust really was, we need to address the European dimension, which is a great challenge, of course, uh, for educators. Um, at the same time, uh, we should, of course, uh, make clear that we are talking here about the fate of individuals. Uh, I don't go into detail here, and I think there is a consensus about this, anyway. Um, and uh, we should try to teach on the level of recent research. Uh, we were reminded of this yesterday very much. Uh, and when I heard, for example, the lecture of uh, Dan Michman, uh, I thought uh, he makes my life more interesting but also more difficult. Uh, because uh, really to integrate the most recent research in a structured Holocaust course is not an easy task. Uh, concerning the meaning, uh, let me first say it in very general terms. Uh, I think we should try to design our educational programs in a way that they provoke reflections which are relevant for today. Uh, not the other way around, uh, having uh, certain questions and then selecting only uh, parts of Holocaust history, which somehow serve our political or whatsoever goal. This, this can be uh, quite distorting. Uh, but we have to think of, uh, when designing the programs, nevertheless, uh, that the students can un and, and our, the participants of our courses or seminars can understand that there are questions addressed which are relevant for their present life. Perhaps we can go into detail more uh, during the talk. Thank you. Michael, please. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, our hosts for an exceedingly warm welcome to Jerusalem. Uh, secondly, I, when I began, first began teaching the Holocaust, which is now almost 40 years ago, my students asked me, why is this relevant? The irony and the tragedy of the world in the last 40 years is that nobody's asking the question as to why it's relevant. Its relevancy seems self-evident. I wish that we lived in a world in which the Holocaust was irrelevant and that we could put it into a historical context in which one could say there was a, tra there was a catastrophic event in the years 1933 and 1945 which taught the world a variety of lessons. It was a turning point, and since then, the world has learned what those quotation marks lessons are, whatever they may be, and uh, has behaved radically differently so that the Holocaust was regarded as a turning point and therefore um, no longer consigned uh, 
to, um, to the question of relevance. I think the students find relevance, and I think they find relevance in the materials, some relevance that is appropriate and some relevance that is inappropriate. And what challenges, um, what always is the issue of relevance is the question, what are the things that you are teaching in addition to the history? And what we have sometimes is we have a gap between the uses of the Holocaust to, for example, deal with multiculturalism, with democracy, with pluralism, with tolerance, with, uh, on another hand, separatism, and with the idea that the entire world is against us, with claims of comparative victimization and all of that. The Holocaust has come to occupy a unique role, at least in American society, and I would argue in the general world. It has become what I've termed the negative absolute in a world of relativism. In a world of relativism, we don't know what's good, we don't know what's bad, but the one thing we can see is that everybody agrees that the Holocaust has become the gold standard of evil. That becomes a means for its trivialization, and we see its use in the political theater as a tremendous amount of trivialization. Opposition to um, the quotation marks medical uh, bill in the United States morphed into a question of Nazi medicine, which then made it relevant to teach what were the original principles of the Nuremberg judgments. We have also opposition to President Obama morphs into images of Adolf Hitler, and if the president has done nothing to deserve the Nobel Peace Prize, he certainly has done nothing to deserve, the, to deserve the comparison with Adolf Hitler, and even those who are most suspicious can at least say he's done nothing yet to deserve the comparison, uh, and I'm not among the suspicion. We have people who are claiming in the Jewish world this is 1933. We have people who are claiming in the Jewish world this is 1938. We have people who are claiming the, in the Jewish world that this is 1942. We have the invocation by supporters of Israel that uh, any withdrawal from territories is a withdrawal to the borders of Auschwitz, as if the Jews had arms and armaments and borders and rockets, etc. at that point. We have claims within uh, the Jewish world that uh, somehow um, uh, you have all of the, this opposition has morphed into the opposition. Ahmadinejad is evil, he is not Adolf Hitler. And the reason is he doesn't have the power to be Adolf Hitler, and thankfully so, and we are not powerless uh, in response to that. So the question of relevance sometimes is also the question of over-relevance, and for my mind, the biggest issue is trivialization, and then the second issue is minimalization. And last point um, that I want to make is that I find over the years that the relevance of the issues raised by the Holocaust grows in time. Let me give one very concrete example. There is no deeper issue in the interreligious life of the world today than the idea of how fundamental, fundamentalist believers passionate readers of their own tradition, passionate believers in their own scripture and in their own holy and sacred text, can begin to relate to the other not as demonic, but as a fellow creature of the divine, and consequently treat them with respect and with restraint on the claims that you want to make in the name of, of religion. Once you teach the Holocaust and you look, for example, about the struggle in the aftermath of the churches to come to terms with what happened, that becomes a model and tells us somewhere of where we have to go, not only where the non-Jewish community has to go, but where the Jewish community itself has to go in relationship to how you embrace fundamentalist teaching that are at the core of our own tradition while embracing, engaging, and treating with dignity and decency those of other traditions. Thank you very much, Michael. I think, I think you raised some very interesting point of views concerning the, the two sides of relevancy, the, what it gives us 
and what are the risks in this kind of relevancy or misuse of the, of the Holocaust in so many contexts. Shulamit, please. Okay, I would say relevant is what's relevant for the teacher and relevant for the students. Shulamit, Say that? Okay. The microphone is No, no, microphone, microphone. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Hi. I say relevant is what's relevant for the teacher and relevant for the students. I, I'm thinking a lot as an educator, really, when I say, um, Professor Maru said yesterday that the Holocaust took place 70 years ago. But I still think to myself many times, we actually share the same um, moral values as uh, in the modern time. And if it collapsed in the Holocaust, and if it was set back, it concerns me as a teacher, especially because I think that until the Holocaust, there was kind of assumption that if you develop technology and if you develop uh, knowledge, you also develop your human behavior. And if it collapsed in the Holocaust, I think it's very relevant for us to ask these questions, what happened there? And I talk a lot to teachers. Are we changing our school system from examining the knowledge of our pupils in mathematics, in geography, to really deal with them of, of the essence of, of mankind and what collapsed there in the Holocaust. I don't feel we're still doing this relevant thing that we have to do with, with what we learn more and more that was set back there in the Holocaust. And if my students, and here I want to distinguish between lesson and meaning, Yesterday we said, and, and Professor Maru said it, uh, and my mentor Professor Bauer said it, uh, uh, said it that um, we can't give simple lessons from the Holocaust. I want to distinguish between lessons and the meaning. I want my students, when they go out of classroom, to sensitize themselves and find the meaning in the lesson. What do I call a meaning? And how do I distinguish between a lesson and a meaning? A lesson is going out of the classroom and saying never again, and then it becomes a cliche. But the meaning is, when they come out of the classroom and they say, I want to know more, I want to think more, I want to um, go interview the survivor that influenced me, and in time, and I think an educational process to make it relevant to our students isn't something that comes after an hour. Or I go to Auschwitz and my students will be better. It's a long process of education. And I want to give an example. When I take uh, my students to Poland, we come to the death camp Majdanek, and Majdanek is a very difficult camp for my students and for me, to come there because you actually, it's a camp there. And we come to the building of the crematorium and we go in there and what can you say in a crematorium? You know, what can you say there? We come into the room where they burnt the bodies of people. And I point, I point out to them that in that room of the crematorium, you see a bath. What is that bath? The bath is with the commander of the crematorium. You know, he used to perspire and he didn't feel very comfortable, so he used to use the heat from the gas chamber to clean himself. Now, I don't talk a lot to my students when we stand there. I just point it out to them and I can see in their eyes that they're thinking about something. We elaborate on the fact that the man, mankind can take a bath next to the crematorium, and I never hear my students saying, I will be better people. But more than once, and it's so interesting because I'm here so many years, my students come after five or six or seven years and they tell me, you remember we talked about how can a mankind take a bath near a crematorium? It influenced many of decisions that we made in life afterwards. This I call something meaningful for my students and relevant to their life to take from that event. So the question is, how do we teach the Holocaust in the historical context that we heard so much today with the depth of it, but find 
ways to sensitize our pupils without trivializing it. And I agree with you, Wolf, that it's not only students, mm -hmm. uh, uh, meaning high school students. I think because we're talking about these kinds of things, it has to be policemen, it has to be, we have the IDF coming here, and many other groups that can be sensitized in order to think, and after you think, you can, and I like very much when a person draws his lesson by himself and you don't oppose it on him, and if he does it after four years or five years or even seven years, this will be relevant meaning for me with my students. I think Shulamit just, uh, I think, described very colorfully the, I would say, the nature of the role of an educator, planting things in the heart of the student, being a believer, I mean, I think educators should, is a believer in a way, because you, you do a lot of things in order to influence the values, the norms, the beliefs, and probably at the end of the day, the, the behavior of your pupil, hoping that they will never have to make tough decisions and pay high price for what you taught them. But still you have to believe that if they will, the things that you told them will be there to help them, to assist them, in choosing right out of wrong, and in most of the cases, you will not be there to, 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 to see them or to support them. It happens from time to time that people five years afterwards, they call you and they said, this was there when I had to make this decision, I thought about what you told me. But in most of the cases, we're not. And we keep doing that, like, you know, Prometheus, taking up the, the stone, because we do believe that that's the only way to deal with education, with a meaningful education experience. So thank you very much, and Professor Wistwort, please. A lot has been said uh, here this morning, and quite uh, naturally and rightly so, about education and the educational challenge. There was a 19th century philosopher who pointed out that the educators themselves have to be educated. His name was Karl Marx, not a very fashionable name to mention <laughs> these days. Coming back. But this is something that Yad Vashem certainly has known how to do over many years. And yet, we live in a world that is in such a state of dizzying and constant change that what we understand as the educational challenge can dramatically alter within the space of a decade. For example, I had the experience some 12 years ago of being commissioned to prepare a package, video, text, and teaching program for Great Britain at the time when Holocaust education for the first time was introduced as part of the national curriculum. All the things that we did at that time, which I think worked very effectively for something like four or five years, need today to be radically rethought because of changes socially, intellectually, politically, which mean that we can no longer take for granted many of the assumptions about the universal meaning and understanding of the Holocaust and the role that it plays, particularly in the Western culture. What do I mean by that? Here I would like to connect with some things that Michael Birenbaum brought out. There is no doubt that we've been living through a period in which not only is Holocaust scholarship and the general consciousness of what happened being challenged by outright and brazen Holocaust denial, even though this remains something of a marginal phenomenon in the Western world, it is still a very potent force in the Arab world, in the Middle East, in parts of the Muslim world. This is something we cannot ignore it's one of the huge challenges of the coming decade, which will have major ramifications for the future of Israel and the wider future of this region. But 
there is the trivialization, there is the relativization, and perhaps most insidious of all, and this hasn't really been mentioned thus far, what I would call the inversion of the Holocaust. The attempt, which is now becoming more straight, more mainstream than it ever was in the past, particularly in Europe, the attempt to present the heirs of the Holocaust, victims, here in Israel as perpetrators, even as a people, a nation of perpetrators, and the Palestinians as their victims. This is something which is now a part of the given state of affairs, which I don't think we can afford to totally ignore when dealing with core issues about the history of the Holocaust. This takes many forms. And I think the only answer to that problem is to make clear in the actual narration of the facts exactly what took place and to underline the very real, often huge differences between conflicts between nations, ethnic conflicts, even things that approach genocide and the particularity, the special features of the Holocaust. We need today, unfortunately, we need to take it into account as part of the complexity and the sensitivity of how we present these events. The second issue which was touched on lightly, but I think needs to be addressed, it's an appalling thought, but it's also in a reality, a reality, is this competition for of victims, of victimhood. We live in a culture of grievance, a culture where to present yourself and the group to which you belong as being victims of history has become almost ingrained. In the United States, this already has a considerable history in the relations between Jews and Afro-Americans. In Eastern Europe, we have a major problem of the, of the narrative of the double genocide and the attempt to present communist totalitarianism as equivalent to Nazi totalitarianism with all that that implies. And this too has made major inroads in Europe, in the European Union. We have many other examples. We have the competition now between the Palestinian Nakba and the Holocaust. The Nobel Prize laureate for literature back in 1998, Imre Kertesz, said an awful thing, but one that bears reflection. He said that the anti-Semites today no longer loathe Jews as much as they want Auschwitz. Now, I don't suggest we need to embrace that statement exactly and literally as it was said, but there is a very uncomfortable truth there grotesque and perverse as it may be. Even in Germany, which has made such great strides in many areas of Holocaust education, even in Germany, periodically, we see how prominent intellectuals, occasionally politicians, will come up with versions of the fact that the real victims of World War II, for example, were not so much the Jews, but the Germans themselves. There are such analogies. It's become more fashionable. There are even best-selling books written along those lines that the massive bombing of German civilians was a kind of holocaust in World War II. Or we have... Um, the statement of the Christian social politician Martin Holman back in 2003, 
that the Jews themselves are a tater folk, a nation of perpetrators. And Germany is relatively a good case compared to other countries. This is the problem also of national narratives. The Jewish narrative is not identical, and nor is the universalist liberal narrative identical with the needs of collective memory in certain nations. And this has to be reflected upon. It has to be dealt with because not all the conclusions that Holocaust scholars have come to can necessarily be applied in an identical fashion. So I think these are troubling thoughts. Nevertheless, they do not take away from the fact that compared with 30, 40, obviously 50 or 60 years ago, the story of the Holocaust, its teaching, the scholarship, the documentation, the eyewitness testimonies have now created a corpus, a body of knowledge which still places us in an infinitely better position than any earlier generation. But we also have to remember while saying that, that we are probably the last, we are the last generation of people who will be able to say that we personally knew those who suffered and came through the Holocaust. So that presents a whole major challenge, not just of teaching and learning, but also of imagination as to how we will convey when those survivors are no longer with us, the core story of what took place in Europe in those dark years. Thank you very much, Professor Wistwit. Uh, I think we, give, we get definitely four different points of views concerning different challenges on the education in the classroom as well as in the general debate, general discourse. And of course, there is a very strong connection between those two because we are teaching or we're doing our education like work within a context. And one of the words that was repeatedly repeated yesterday was the importance of the context in learning about the Holocaust, but also in teaching about it. And uh, you know, the fact that is yesterday uh, there was a quote from uh, Professor Gutmann about the Holocaust refuses to be an history, and there is a lot of deepness in this statement. I mean, you can look at it, you can listen to it very superficially, but you can listen to it very in the deepest sense of the meaning of the refusal of the Holocaust to become an history, not only a lesson in history, but to become something ancient that we, is not playing an active role in the discourse. I think that uh, for us as educators, this is a huge challenge that every one of the, of the participants of this panel pointed out different angle of that. And I would like just to elaborate just a little bit about this question. Are there limitations? Can you draw a line? Can you draw the barriers when it is applicable, when it is, I would say, when it is something that we can, we as educators think it's valid, the connection that we're made, making, and when we should be very strongly standing against it and say this is unacceptable. This is, those are things that we cannot do and we cannot compare and we cannot and if, if, if we do compare, we do, we do have to deal not only with the similarities, but also with the differences. Uh, yes, please. Let me, begin, let me begin by responding to that. Look, the problem that we faced when we were creating the Holocaust Museum was that people confused comparison with equivalence. Again. They ref confused comparison with equivalence. With equivalence. To say something compares to something else does not mean that it's equivalent to something That's else. Correct. And comparison, you've just established it. Comparison establishes what it shares in common and where it is different. I know. And it's very important to understand that you do both. And the only way you can understand the singularity of the Holocaust 
is by understanding where it compares to other events and where it is different. The only way you can deal with the unprecedentedness is to follow, out, follow what is common to the human experience and what is distinctly manifested here, and it's very important. I spend a good deal of my public time in op-eds talking about using the opportunity of false comparisons to talk about the real understanding of the event. Let me give you three very simple examples. One, you had the comparison of our health care bill to Nazi medicine on the question in the United States of, in the end of life, you had the opportunity at 65 and at 70 to consult the physician and to come with instruct and it was be paid for by the government, and to come up with instructions to your heirs and to your physicians as to what end of life issues are. So that provided me with the opportunity to show the first principle of Nuremberg, which was the principle of informed consent, and to show the, uh, the Nuremberg uh, doctor's trials, and to show the fact that this is essentially allowing you to be informed of the alternatives that you face and the consent that you have. So instead of saying there is no comparison, mm -hmm. it's the opportunity to teach and to educate. When we began hearing in the United States by all of our defense agencies, that this is 1933 or it's 1938. Or when we began to hear the words, withdrawal is the withdrawal to the borders of Auschwitz, it offers you the opportunity to explain the difference between the radical powerlessness of the Jews who faced Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, Chelmno, Belzec, etc., and the incredible achievements of the Jewish community in the post-Holocaust era which is the incredible achievement of empowerment. Now, again, if you're looking, and this touches on Robert, if you're looking, looking at national narrative, if we learn from the Holocaust that powerlessness invites victimization, and therefore we opted to empower, we opted for an army of flag, we opted, we opted for uh, the, the tremendous political organization of American Jury, we have discovered now that power does not solve all problems. It merely gives you the tools in which to confront because the ongoing narrative of the Jewish people is an ongoing narrative. It has not ended. Now, similarly, um, when, you, when you face, the, and, and I want to touch on one more thing Robert said. Look, uh, let me be candid and, and, and let me d be direct because that's, one of the biggest challenges we educators face today, and especially institution builders and the like, is that there has been a splitting between the human rights community and the human rights advocacy community and the pro-Israel community. And consequently, to the degree that the human rights community sees Holocaust education as a pleading for Israel, and as a special pleading for Israel, we have seen essentially that all of a sudden Holocaust education is a contested value instead of a value that is non-contested and universally acceptable. But the very idea of the mistakes that are made in false equivalization offers you the opportunity to educate as to the actual history and also the opportunity to understand where the mistakes are made and never fear comparison, provided you understand that comparison is not equivalence. And the other thing is we can never have a comparison of suffering. We can have a comparison of the structure of the nature of evil. The very nature of suffering is the fact that it is personal and it is unique to themselves. And I can give you the deepest personal example of that, and with this I'll conclude. When my father of blessed memory died, we sat, we're traditional Jews, we sat Shiva. Only one group of people began to disturb me and I couldn't stand them. When they asked my mother what happened to your husband in the middle of her retelling her story of loss, they interrupted, you think what happened to your soul is bad, you should hear what happened to my Jake. <laughs> the idea that because somebody suffered structurally, deeply, more profoundly, etc., doesn't offer comfort to those in suffering. 
What we find unique is that in the education of the survivors is that when they are able to use their suffering to embrace, to engage, to empathize, to reach, to touch, uh, and, and the like, then something very deep happens. Example, Gerda Klein taught at Columbine, and she was able to talk about how you overcome that. When we deal with, with suicide and somebody says, you know, suicide is the final solution to a temporary problem. They begin to engage students because they're talking out of their experience to something where they have universal respect and recognition and they're able to offer wisdom and guidance that's very different than comparison and equivalence. Before Sulamit, I would like Wolf, Sunday Wolf presented us with a very, some of us, I mean, it was not, it was the European division uh, activity, uh, with activities that was done with specific vocational uh, schools and, uh, and professional development of prof different profession that is done in, in Vanze. And I think the issue of relevancy and the issue of where, where you draw the limits of the comparison is very strongly appears there. Can you elaborate a bit about that? What are the principles that you implement in your activities? And maybe you can share with the, with the audience, you know, your experience. I'm not sure that everybody knows. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, Comparison is not the only way you make connections between past and present. Exactly. Uh, I believe more in reflections on the presence coming out of dealing with the past mm -hmm. in a relevant way. Um, so that is what we try to do uh, when uh, teaching or having seminars. Uh, we usually try to make them as active as possible, the participants as active as possible, so uh, it's less teaching than uh, starting discussions based on primary source material. Uh, the topic of these uh, seminars for various vocational groups are the participation, the topic is in various forms, the participation of these vocational groups during the Holocaust. Different attitudes, not all of them were perpetrators. You find also exceptions, uh, and one has to include all uh, these different attitudes. Um, and this uh, makes them think about their actual professional work and their attitudes uh, in their work. And this, is, this has uh, several dimensions. Um, the first one is the individual choices, what Chulamit addressed. Uh, I would add, however, uh, what becomes clear when we deal with these topics is that we do not have only a responsibility for our individual moral choices. We also have a responsibility for the society and for the state. And these are different levels also in terms of the historical aspects we have to deal with. It's not individual choices is an important topic and the scope of action is very crucial to show that there was such a scope of action and that people behave differently and mm -hmm. to try to find out why certain people behaved in this way or the other. But uh, we also have to look at the structures that changed in society and in the state. Um, because what we can see when we look at the history of the Holocaust is that in a very, very short period of time, things fundamentally changed. When we look back now for 12 or 15 years, well, things have changed, but our situation in most of our countries at least is rather the same as it was some uh, one or two decades ago. When we look at the Holocaust period, we see a fundamental change here. We had a democratic, when I speak about Germany, we had a democratic state with a constitution protecting the rights of the citizens. Uh, we had uh, the rule of law. We, um, of course, there were roots of the developments which we saw later um, also in the Weimar Republic, but people did not feel like that. 
And what happened then was a crisis, and out of the crisis, a catastrophe. What we have to understand, I think, is that we cannot av avoid crises. Uh, we are just now, in Europe, facing a, a crisis, and people develop fears. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe uh, that we will come to a, a state of affairs where crises don't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. The question is how do we deal with these crises and how do we avoid that hum uh, humanitarian catastrophes develop from these crises on the political level, on the social level, on the individual level. This is a very important thing to, to, to remember that we, the, the question is not whether we have a crisis, and, but how we deal with it. And as educators, as we are, you know, we're teaching the politicians and decision makers of tomorrow, they should remember that lesson very carefully. I, I really understand it, that teachers will come after teaching the Holocaust, and it's very natural to look around at what's happening today. I, as, as an educator, I, I mean, I'm teaching the Holocaust. I'm teaching it as a human story. I'm teaching the story of people where, where it, it doesn't matter how we divide it, perpetrators, bystanders, rescuers, they were all human beings. Of course it brings me and my students to see, and, and we say, okay, when we compare, let's have the Holocaust as a paradigm. And I would like to quote here, in 2005, we had teachers from Rwanda coming here to Yad Vashem, and look how they said they see the connections. You suffered before we did, and we can learn a lot from you. The meeting with Holocaust survivors helped me more than anything to cope with trauma I experienced. Other people, even psychologists, know how to pity. These meanings help me to understand what I really feel. I wanted to do something for my children's memory, but also for the children of Rwanda who were killed. When I saw the memorial here, I felt like my children were calling to me. This is what Yolanda Mogasaka says, a, a, a doctor from Rwanda, she sees the natural connection, of course, the Holocaust with the historical context, we have to put it there. And when, if, you, if you connect Holocaust with something else, so first of all, as, as Professor Bauer said yesterday, begin with the Holocaust, but then you'll see the connection immediately, like Yolanda saw it here. And I'll tell you the methods that I think I would do with my students, the more I see the connection and me having to deal with it. I will take with my students Lemkin. I think he is something that I can find him the connection as a Holocaust survivor, escaping from lost 49 members of his family, escaping to America, uh, um, and, and coining the, the, the word genocide. You know, when they accepted it at the end, he cried because the first thing, he was so lonely. And I show my students, this is not saying never again. I mean, I'm not afraid of never again if you do something with it. If you uh, um, stimulate your students, like Lemkin, in, in, in a way, he was so lonely, no one listened to him. But he saw the connection between the, th the, the, the two and did something with it. If you say, Wolf, and, and Michael also said, to do something with it, I do think today that I would take uh, Gregory Stanton, although I don't agree with all the stages that he says, but he says there is something that is predictable and can be influenced. I think that this is an education, something that we can take. And, he's, and in the Holocaust, as um, Judah Bauer taught us, there is that unprecedented, and we will say not everything is just like it. But if Jeffrey Stanton says, you know, there's um, a polarization, there's dehumanization, there's things that you find in other, uh, I would say, elements in other genocides. What I did is, I really went to Rwanda. I took the diary of Yolanda Mogasaka and I saw what she says about propaganda there in, 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 in Rwanda. 
And she says, uh, 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 she quotes, a Houthi nose is thin and his, his hair is curly. Of course we see the elements that we see there in the Holocaust. And when Yolanda is talking about polarization, she's talking about, she says, until the age of 12, my daughter went to school and she was a, a, a Tutsi and she didn't even know the difference. And suddenly the teacher tells us, tells her you cannot stay anymore in school, you are a, a, an outcast. And when we learn, of course, the Holocaust, we see these elements there in the Holocaust. And I would take with my students something, and it's very interesting that after I teach them the eight stages there, they say, well, there is something that maybe we can influence a lot, not running to Darfur today or doing something like that, but this kind of awareness. If we begin showing that there are elements that are predictable and can be influenced, and I think that this is the, the, the important thing, we can bring it in a way to education, and I encourage meetings with, with, with survivors from, from the genocide of Rwanda and other things, because I think that this, it can give power to the Holocaust, which is unprecedented, and it can give the place of other genocides also. And, and we're moving there, and I think this is relevancy that, that I see in it, but First of all, let's get the facts of the Holocaust right. I mean, let's begin with, 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 with what we say, learning about the Holocaust, that we can take these elements, that we can take Yolanda to say, when I came here, I felt that there's a lot from what happened to you that you can offer to us. And I see that direction. With people who are coming with a very definite view in mind, who already have some kind of background, usually, and what has happened in the public domain? There is often, and I think, a growing gap because it's out of our control already. None of us, whatever influence we may have, can actually control the way that this cataclysmic event is perceived around the world by so many different people. It so happens a number of years ago Michael and I found ourselves in China on a three-week tour in which uh, the main event was held at Nanjing University and it was at the invitation of the Chinese and it was quite clear both from um, conversations at lunchtime and elsewhere outside of the conference with Chinese students and professors that the single most important question in their minds was, um, apart from learning about the Holocaust, which they were interested in, was the comparison with the Nanjing massacre of 1937 when the Japanese army carried out a, a, a mass murder of about 300,000 Chinese in what was then the capital of China and mass rapes and so on. And the most revealing point was to hear Chinese professors saying, how did you succeed in you, meaning the Jews? That was, that was the perception. How did you, this small people, the Jews, which many of them expressed great admiration for, how did you succeed in grabbing the attention of the world? How did you communicate the tragedy of the Jewish people and how can we learn from you because the world totally ignores what happened to us in Nanjing, which is by and large true except for a small handful of people who know about it. Now that's one example and it's not so uncommon. The moment we step out of a, a Eurocentric, a Westocentric or an Israelocentric context, this whole subject looks very, very different. Um, there are also less agreeable, uh, used to be called third world perspectives, which great anger is expressed over the fact that the Holocaust appears to be uh, on a pedestal as a uniquely diabolical um, example of uh, murder, exploitation, uh, dehumanization, 
when the colonial experience that is central to many peoples in what used to be called the third world, um, they feel, uh, I think wrongly, but nevertheless that's what they feel, has somehow been submerged by this. And there are also in Europe, there are many echoes more on the left of that particular um, perspective. So I think we need, we cannot make the assumptions that this is perceived in the way a, that we think it should be from a scholarly point of view. We can do the best that we can do, and the scholarship is there. It's already an important corpus. All the time, educational techniques are evolving. They are improving, and they have potentially great power to reach a universal audience. One thing, though, I have to say about the universal dimension. I know that there's this ongoing argument. It's been around for decades. Uh, I mean, Michael will remember it from the US Holocaust Museum about do we include the non-Jewish victims and what place do we give them in the overall story of the Holocaust. That was a big debate over 30 years ago. But it goes on in different forms to this day. It probably will never disappear. It, it's almost structurally built in to the question which obviously concerns Jews very intensely because the Holocaust happened first and foremost to the Jewish people. Not exclusively, but what we understand is the Holocaust did happen to the Jewish people. And um, what do we do about that in today's world? One thing I want to share with you, which somewhat surprised me, and this goes back to the experience I had in Britain in talking over a number of years with many teachers who had to actually implement in the national curriculum the guidelines which we had prepared for them. And the most interesting and surprising um, discovery from what they said was, we feel that the biggest gap in our communicating this experience to what is a 99.5% audience of non-Jews, school children in Great Britain, is how little they know about the Jews, and that's what we would like to learn the most about. Give us material about the Jewish people, the history of the Jews, because it's a missing dimension that we find in many of the textbooks, in much of the historiography, um, of course, in Israel, nobody would say that. But again, we have to realize that outside of Israel, it's a very different context. And the knowledge about the Jewish people, who are the Jews, and in all their complexity, this is something you absolutely cannot take for granted. So actually, the Jewish dimension is very important, mm -hmm. even in conveying the universal message. Thank you. I would like to move to the next question, which is a challenge that we are talking quite a lot the last few years, and this is the natural disappearance of the survivors. Uh, can I please, I want to start by a very short uh, testimony, Itka's testimony, part of the echoes and reflection testimonies uh, uh, come, coming from the Shoah Foundation, and I would like you to present that, and then we'll ask the question about what is, the what is the future? How do we deal with those, this disappearance as, with the fact that we are going to miss the Holocaust survivors in the future? Spiritually, I sound and feel what sound. I And I remember one time you restarted when please. I was in Auschwitz and I felt the burden, the bitter taste of slavery. And I felt oh, if I would have a pencil and paper now, I would write a poem. But there was no pen pencil and paper. I told you my earthly possessions was what I wore and the bowl, the enamel bowl in which we got the soup. So I wrote a poem in my head. And when I was liberated, 
When I came here to America, of course, I couldn't speak a word of English. It was constant adjusting from one to the other. So that was among my first poems. I would like to share it. I feel like a bird with clipped wings tied to this earth by invisible strings, chained to a destiny I did not choose. I feel like a prisoner that cannot break loose. I look at the sky with a heavy sigh, but my wings have been clipped and I can no longer fly. And then I realize that the concept of freedom is a bird in flight and not in a bird in a cage. And I pledge to myself, I'll get out. I will never use brute force. I will never try to force somebody to do something, but neither will I allow other people to do it. I understood the concept of freedom. I understood what my forefathers, what the, the Jews in Egypt, the Israelites in Egypt must have felt like. And I realized that there is no substitute for personal experience, from knowledge derived from personal experience. I realized then that nothing in the world, no textbook, no professor, not the best college could teach me what my experience taught me because I had to I got to know myself who I am, how much I could endure, how much I could understand, how much I could feel, and how, what I became. Well, when we all see different testimonies along our activities, and the role of the survivors, the fact that they are here, is very important for us as educators, Shulamit. How would you, how do you look at the future without survivors being available anymore? The more, the more I'm thinking about it, it will be a loss that uh, is bigger than we think even. I remember 10 and 15 years ago when they said we have to prepare when survivors won't be here. So I said, okay, we're taking testimonies. We put these testimonies. And then I saw more and more that we have to think it in a much more thorough way. And I begin asking myself, what is that thing that survivors offer us that we have to identify it to understand what will happen when they won't be here? And I went to my staff and I said, I tried to figure out, I made a small research. I said, tell me, you organize, I, t I told my pupils, courses, you, you bring um, uh, literature, you bring history, you bring everything. What is that thing that the survivor offers us that is different than other things we bring our students? And when I got these results, I understood that survivor offers us things that is beyond the testimony. They don't only give the story, they don't tell us only what happened, but they do much more than that. They actually have a kind of moral stand when they're there, they look you in the eye, and I think it influences, and if we talked before that, that one of our goals is to sensitize our pupils, again, not lessened, but sensitizing my students, to do something more with Holocaust education, this was the survivor there. Because many students come after the testimony of survivors and say, now we want to interview him. Most of the projects um, that we give a prize here in Israel goes with interviewing survivors, with learning their stories. And it's always that the student says, now, now something happened to me beyond the testimony kind of commitment to the memory, a kind of things that I would say go beyond the testimony. So what you see here is a testimony really that we chose to the, the curriculum that developed with ADL and we show our foundation that's called Echoes and Reflections. I think that now we the teachers will have to pick the segments. We will have to do what the survivor did. We you know, I could choose just a testimony telling the story of Auschwitz, but we chose Itka because Itka was giving us something more than the story. 
She was giving here, she was talking about the concept of freedom. She was talking about what is to be a bird in a cage. She was giving my students something that I call it beyond the testimony. So I think this is one direction that we have to go there. We as educators, again, it depends uh, uh, for what you're picking this testimony. If you're picking it from the museum, I don't think it's the same. But teachers will have to now do a lot of the work that the survivors themselves did in picking the testimonies. Another project that we're doing now, and I think it's succeeding a lot, we decided um, about four years ago or something like that to do a project, we call it the autobiographical stories of the survivors. We took, in fact, the survivors to their hometowns, where they're telling us, you know, they become like children when they reach the hometown. Suddenly, they talk to the pupils in a way that sensitizes them. Let's say, most of the survivors, when they come to their hometown, suddenly talk about family life. They talk about their schools. They talk about the environment there that suddenly stimulates my students to want to know more about this town from before the Holocaust. It does something beyond the testimony. When they go to the places where they were persecuted and they stand there, they can tell you the horrors, but on the other hand, they also tell you the stories of how they found friends in Auschwitz. When a survivor tells my students, I found a friend in Auschwitz, I think it brings friend, the word friendship a, a, a new meaning. So the survivors will tell us there, Ovadia from Saloniki, that we took him to this autobiographical um, journey to, uh, in fact, he already died since we took this, um, since we took him on the journey, what we say, this autobiographical journey. He was saying, you know, I was beaten by the capo, but there was a woman standing next to there, and she was Elisa, and Elisa was the lady he fell in love with in Auschwitz. And he can also tell us from there the stories of courage and life from these places. And the third thing that they do in this autobiographical journey that I think is very valuable is telling us how they return to life. The choice that they made, the survivors, which I think is an educator so important because the survivor said there, you know, I was so depressed, I didn't want to live another day. He tells the students it in this autobiographical journey. But if I, he tells the student, find courage in myself to build life after the chaos, after everything was taken away from me, he sends a great message of the value of life to the students. So I think, I think we need more interdisciplinary um, approaches, which gives the human, you know, if... Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to know one of our um, survivors told one of our educators when they arrived to Auschwitz together, he said, I never left Auschwitz and you will never enter Auschwitz at the end of the day. And I think this summarizes it, but on the other hand, we have to find, as I said, the elements of, of beyond the testimony to do it by ourselves. I think what Shulamit, at least to me, what, I, what I've learned from what I've heard from Shulamit now, is that when we're listening to the testimony, and usually we try to squeeze it and to make it very accurate when we transfer it to, to students, we have to listen not only to the evidential, factual stories, but what is lying behind that. What they're saying to us really. Not where they went, where from, where to. Not only that. And I think this is something that we should be very careful not to miss when, we are, when we're becoming the messengers of those stories. Yes, please. Okay. May, may I just uh, make a very short intervention? Yes, please. Uh, I must say, I'm a bit pessimistic about the possibility really to substitute a personal encounter even with the most sophisticated way uh, of using uh, taped testimonies. And I would be glad to be convinced of the opposite. Let me make a, a large point and then a series of much smaller points. The largest point is there's going to come a moment in time, and we're getting there very closely. And I, I do this as a person 
who this week alone uh, interviewed uh, Professor Yehuda Bauer and Yitzchak Arad on Axion Reinhardt and Treblinka, and spent um, nine hours so far with Samuel Willenberg, who is the last living survivor of Treblinka. And therefore, you can understand the difference between those who talk about and those who live through. We are coming to the moment when this is going to move from living memory to historical memory. That is a radical transition. Most institutions are well under planned for what that's going to mean. That's the bad news. I had a student in a business school who thought of a wonderful thing. She said, uh, in business planning, they uh, say, if you can anticipate a problem, you can plan for it. She then asked me if I would work on her dissertation. And she interviewed 102 different institutions on what they were planning to do after the survivors were no longer. And she found everybody knew the problem was coming and nobody had done serious planning for it. Bad news, good news. No generation has left behind a greater record mm -hmm. than this generation. Shoah Foundation has 52,000 plus testimonies in, um, in, uh, in uh, uh, 57 languages from 32 countries. I would estimate if we did the total of it, we're talking about in excess of 80,000 testimonies, video testimonies, because video testimonies were invented. They present certain problems, they, but they present a certain vividness and we've seen even great scholars like Yehuda Bauer and Christopher Browning have learned to work with this material historically and recognize its importance. And we don't know the scope of what we have. I have a fellow who just contacted me from the Ukraine who has nine different local historical museums, all of whom are interested in the story of the Jews who lived in their towns. We went to the Shoah Foundation. They had 79 testimonies from these small towns. What he will be able to do with them, we do not know. Now, the other part of it is that means we not only have an elite record of the few, but we have a multiple record, record of everybody who went through it from the most sophisticated academic to the most ordinary, extraordinary peasant. And our task as educators, filmmakers, Scholars and everything else will be to make use of this. Remember, in Jewish thought, story is the most powerful ele element of narrative. The first Rashi on the first book in the, in, 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 on the first word in the Bible says, says, if this was a book of law, we would begin in the 12th chapter of Exodus, and the Jews take a very long time to get the 12th chapter of Exodus. That's rich. Remember the power of Christianity. Christianity is based on four narratives of the life of Jesus. Imagine what could be done if you had other people who had seen this, experienced this, spoken about it, and our task will be to be able to make something of this in a very concrete and brilliant way. Filmmakers must deal with this material. They're drawn to it. They're empowered, they're empowered by it. We learned something of survivors in the encounter, and I've seen this in multiple cultures. We've learned something that they didn't see of themselves, which is the real story of resilience. It echoes for the students because high school is for many students about defeat. I didn't, I don't have to remind you, but you know, I asked her out, she said no. I was hoping to get an A on the exam, and I didn't get an A on the exam. My best friend hurt me and betrayed me. You walk around with the walking wounded, and let alone the social and economic consequences of people who have gone through a difficult time. If they can make something of their life after they went through that experience, then there is a possibility for me. Now, somebody like Lawrence Langer says the resilience hides the brokenness, and we have to hero, he, hear both, both of that, but we must understand the capacity of witness. Let me raise one final issue. Look, we have a major succession issue not only with survivors. 
Who in the Christian community is a replacement for Franklin Littell? Who in the Catholic community is a replacement for the John Pavlikovsky, for the Rose, Rose uh, Thiering? Who in Israel, and Yibadel Chaim Admea Vesrim, who in Israel is going to have the moral stature of a Yehuda Bauer? There is no natural successor. And that is somebody who is rooted in the scholarship and the learning, can speak of all the particularity, and reach to every one of the universal themes. Not that I agree with him. <laughs> Not that I agree with him on all of that, but there is no natural moral successor. Uh, ironically, there is a great succession in scholarship. Any of us who are scholars of the Holocaust understand that we can read day and night and not keep up with our field, even if we only read the most significant books. So the transition and look, as one generation edges the, uh, ages, the question of transition, let's say its implications for education are going to also be a greater limitation in the amount of funding available. And the second generation is not going to be able to pick up that moral slack that has developed. So there's a large problem of succession, but problems create opportunity. And the opportunity of educators to use this material is limitless. But Michael, I don't think that they have to do the same. This is exactly the thing. This transition will bring a lot of new things and stimulate us to, to, to new directions. And I think it's there because, as you said, it's documented. The material is there. The, the, the scholarly work is there. Now the question is how we transmit it and, and new opportunities that I think in that interdisciplinary approach that's going to come out. Because if I had the choice to bring all survivor or to deal with literature, I wouldn't deal with literature, I would bring a survivor, you understand? And I think it will open, and, and not that we can say that it, it replaces anything, because I, I, I think we understand, we have to understand that it won't be there, but I think the ground is set to creative things to come up with that Holocaust education. Please. Well, I think that the most important things have been said but I would merely add one or two uh, small points. First of all, of course it's true that there is, in the literal sense, and there cannot be any replacement for the survivors. The point is arriving closer by the day. The true answer is that we don't know exactly if and how that particular gap, and it's a very important one which will emerge, will be filled. We just don't know. We can speculate, we can make informed guesses. It will not be the same. I had the experience of, uh, on a number of occasions, of sharing a platform with a survivor, and there's no question that students are fascinated in the questions that they raise are more immediate, more directly relating to their experience, their ability to empathize is greatly reinforced by that contact. We won't have that. That is a fact. It's equally true that probably never before in history have so many visual testimonies or oral testimonies uh, been collected. How they will work, whether they will be able to do the job in a new kind of teaching framework, because it will have to be adjusted, is something we'll see. The one point which I think we should not underestimate, for good and for bad, is the power of the creative imagination in the arts, mm -hmm. in literature, in film, even in dance, in all kinds of areas that we uh, perhaps don't fully appreciate, but the Holocaust has now become a part of that. We're in it, but it will, and maybe the importance 
of this way of grappling, which is not restricted to and shouldn't be restricted purely to the historical record, this is something that may actually enhance. There are risks, there are dangers, but it may enhance people's ability to empathize with or understand at some more emotional level the significance of this event. I wouldn't underestimate that. It may assume ever greater importance in the years to come. Absolutely. I think what we hear here is that the challenge is there and it is on our shoulders, educators, not to find a replacement, but to find new avenues to reach the hearts of the students, uh, things that Holocaust survivors are, are doing spontaneously, you know, just by being there and by sharing their stories. And this is a big challenge that we will try to share the rest of the day. And you can see it, I mean, the, you, you said dance. You, didn't, you don't know that yesterday there was a dance here. You don't know, but there was. And there are, you, know, you, you look at the, at, the, at the walls of the piazza, family piazza, the entrance of the school, you see attempt of young, young designers to deal with those issues because we're really trying to search, not to say that they will find something that will replace it, but something that will find new avenues. Let me just add one more word. Remember something else, which, um, you know, I, I had great and deep disagreements with the late Peter Novak, but Peter Novak said something very important at the end, which he hated saying, which is that there now have been created institutions that will be responsible for carrying memory, uh -huh. uh, you see the power of a museum by being at Yad Vashem. There are other museums, you see a power there. You also realize that that gives you educational opportunities, scholarly opportunities, staff opportunities, and the like. Uh, if you go now with the type of work that's been done in a variety of places, the institution, but the most important thing about the institutions is they cannot become stale and stagnant, bureaucratic, and lacking creativity. They have to always remain, retain the charisma and be faithful to the charisma of the event. And, if, and, and look, that's been a problem with institutionalization from the very beginning but we must become faithful to the charisma of the event and find new language to understand it. One more point. One of the reasons I have confidence when the Holocaust is in discussion with genocides is because as I see other people working on genocides, I realize that we have had 60 years of enormous work scholarship, creativity, art, literature, music, museum making, filmmaking, and other groups that want to begin to deal with telling their story and finding a way have to learn from this. This becomes the model. It becomes the point. It becomes the paradigm mm -hmm. for it. And I cannot tell you how many times I get visits from other institutions wanting to do this, who want to learn what we did and they're well behind. So in that world of comparison or how we reach from one to another, not equivalence, but in understanding it, we have a very significant, and I would daringly say a secure place. Would that the scholarship in other areas were as good? Would as the creativity was as good? And therefore, we can be confident that we can hold the place of this event as we go through institutional life. What, what Michael is actually saying here, what Michael is actually saying here, is now that we here? if we if we if we take the politics out of um, the connection between uh, Holocaust and genocide, and and I I, I would say the travelizing and other things we can see here something that Holocaust can so much offer for other things. And as you said, the stability there, and that's why I always think to myself, if what we said, all the politics is out there and the misusing and using it like that, the Holocaust, as we, we, we summarize it here, can offer a lot to 
others that are now recently and, and doing it. And I learned so much from that group from Rwanda that was here and we're connecting to them. They told me that them, when they went back afterwards to Rwanda, they took our sets of posters that's called to bear witness, put it in the front, then in the back they felt that they're secured enough to tell their story. So, y you know, it's, it's, if, if the politics, you know, it's naive educator to say politics is out of there, but if you do it from the right reasons and not the use and abuse that is happening today, it, it, it can help it actually. Two points I want to raise following what, what we just heard is an answer for this question about what will happen when survivors will not be when survivors will not be with us anymore. Uh, two points. First of all, the charisma of the, of the event, as you said, this is a huge opportunity, but there is a risk. We can't count on that to work on its own. And educators has to be the mediators between the charisma of the events and the students. And this is a very, very tough role. And the other thing, which might be the answer to this tough role, is exactly what we're doing here, is the dialogue. The dialogue that we educators can conduct with each other, listen to ideas, to the creativity that emerged in Hungary, in Poland, in Germany, in the America, in United States, wherever. All these new ideas, that, because the ideas are in, in the mind of people. And you'll see tones of new creative idea that worked. Use the opportunity to take them with you and translate them into an educational, in the educational environment that you are operating in. Because I can tell you, just, just for example, the idea, which is not a very highly creative, uh, innovative idea, about design competition that was adopted by so many of our graduates and implemented in so many different ways, enabled so many youngsters to be engaged, emotionally involved, and express their perception of the connection between themselves and the Holocaust in a variety of ways, but they all start from the same point. And I think that that's an opportunity for us and that's for us to dialogue with each other to share that. But we can dialogue in actual life here, but there is another thing that comes into the picture and that's the 21st century te technology. Again, an opportunity, a challenge, a risk. How do we look at technology as educators? How can we use it and not misuse it, how can it be to our help, what we should be, be, you know, suspicious about, and so on. But I would like Professor Vistos to start, please. Technology and education and Holocaust education. Well, if we, if we start with the darker side of the picture, uh, it is a fact, and I speak here more as a historian of uh, anti-Semitism, contemporary as well as, uh, uh, as well as historical, that modern technologies, and in particular uh, the internet, have in fact been a godsend to a whole range of bigots, racists, anti-Semites, fanatics of all kind, and Holocaust deniers. That goes along with a fantastic contribution that it's made to the expansion of knowledge worldwide. So we have to understand, it's built in like everything else that is human, every technological progress has its bright and its dark side, and they will be continually in conflict. This leads me also to a point which is, although not directly connected with technology, but I think it's related to an issue that we didn't really discuss here, but it's something that happens to preoccupy me a great deal in my own work. And that is, how do we present the question of anti-Semitism, which is an ongoing and very serious issue looked at from a global perspective to the Holocaust narrative. And one thing that I've grown increasingly convinced of in recent years, although I guess I realized it a long time ago, 
is that Holocaust denial or the, uh, Holocaust education, despite its absolutely essential function and the many important things it has contributed, is not an antidote in and of itself to anti-Semitism. In certain contexts, certain circumstances, it can play a valuable role, particularly in terms of presenting the basic facts. In those places where they are not known, where there is widespread ignorance. The other side of that coin is that the Holocaust has become almost a magnet for all kinds of deniers, relativizers, new style anti-Semites, old style anti-Semites, and that also will continue. And we'll have to fight that as well. And we already ha are doing it. Coming back to technology, we don't have any choice in the matter. The world moves on technologically. Everything that is said in any place almost in the world of can potentially go onto YouTube. It can reach an audience that in the past, even 20 years ago, people could not dream of. Um, and that applies both to truths and it applies to falsehoods and to rumors. And somebody, I think it was Mark Twain, said it a century ago. That, and, and in those days, the communications were fairly primitive in compared to today. That you know, um, the rumor can spread around the world and the falsehood before truth even has time to get its socks on. And this is <laughs> even more true today. It's at a click of a mouse. So the technology has great promise, and it also has a potentially very destructive role unless we find ways, and I don't know if there is a way, to contain the worst aspects, but it's a Pandora's box it's, and it's been opened. There's no containment. Uh, yeah. Let me. No, uh, one minute. Uh, I would just add a very short remark. Uh, I think they are not only dangerous in the modern technology, they are also temptations. Mm. Uh, temptations in so far as technology makes our life easier, which is a good thing in, in general. However, uh, it can uh, produce uh, the uh, idea that learning can be done without effort. Mm. And I'm, as a, I'm conservative in this point. I don't believe in that. I think that a serious encounter with the Holocaust cannot be done by edutainment. Uh, it, there must be a serious effort um, so we should use all the opportunities, the great variety of uh, methodology, etc., that the modern technology provides us with. But we m must also make clear to ourselves and to our students there is still an effort needed. Um, let's begin by saying there's no containment to technology. I mean, we had a very humorous event in uh, the New York area. You had a gathering of 40,000 Jews filling City Field, protesting the internet. It won't help. It's over. <laughs> it can't, it, 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 it's not, not going to happen. It's over. Uh, I carry around more pocket in my, more power in my pocket than was able to fuel the first atomic bomb. If you ever go to the museum, to the, to the museum at, at Los Alamos and you see the primitive use they made of calculations, you can't believe it. And any of us who have a laptop have a more powerful technology than what used to take up multiple rooms. There's a dark side to technology which is not only gives everybody a platform, the deepest dark side to technology was expressed to me my, my um, uh, college roommate who is a prominent psychiatrist in Silicon Valley who regards it as the great success of achievement if a couple sits at a table 
male, male, female, female, male, fem, female, doesn't bother him, but if a couple sits at a table and actually talks to each other instead of texting each other. <laughs> and that is that if you get into that, there is an addiction. In the modern Orthodox world in the United States, you have a very basic problem, which is kids who are addicted to texting, who sneak up into the room on Shabbat afternoon and text each other while they would not dare turn on a light and they would not dare go in a car and they would not dare eat anything that's not under uh, glat kosher hashkacha. They are texting because there's an addictive quality. Technology offers, and by the way, when you say technology for the 21st century, you're talking about technology for the next three to five years. Weeks, the, weeks, weeks. Th three to five years because the reality is that all of our technolo technology is obsolete in three to five years and it's more powerful. It's the only thing we get that is more powerful and more capable for less expense. Offers us phenomenal opportunity. I can now teach courses from my desk answer and encounter students and save myself 12, 15, 18, 24, 36 hours of, of, um, of travel. I can now um, communicate with the world. Let me say something. I edited the, I was the managing editor of the Encyclopedia Judaica. I came away not with respect for what we did, but with awe for what my predecessors did. My predecessors, I could go to get the information on the multiple names of a city by touching Google Maps. They would have to spend a day in the library. We had 22 million words, 16 volumes, 28,000 contributions, and we didn't have to type a damn word. And we were able to send it to be published and put it online like that. They spent two years between when the information was gathered, edited, and, and the like. So the possibility for the increase of knowledge. Now, what's the risk? The risk is that one PowerPoint talks to everybody's computers and nobody learns in between. The risk is also that if you put up your PowerPoint, they don't establish a relationship with you. You are enormously empowered and that but you are also enormously challenged and part of that is also the challenge of remembering that we are human beings and personal contact and the example of personal engagement is profoundly important and the dehumanization that takes place because of technology is one of the very frightening elements of the world in which we live even as we enjoy its power and look, I, I came here so I have my laptop, my iPad, my, uh, uh, my uh, two phones because I have an Israeli phone and an American phone. I'm getting emails, I'm getting calls and I'm trying to sit in a conversation. That's the world in which we live. We educators have to educate by using its power and diseducate by reminding, meaning meaning our kids are tech natives, we are tech immigrants. What us tech immigrants know is that there once was a human being you could touch, you could share a glass of wine with, you could go out with, you could enjoy. Not all encounter has to be virtual encounter. There has to be real encounter. Sulamit, the challenge is to educate. At the end of the day, it's the language of our students. If we, want, if we talk about relevancy, uh, technology is their language, all the access there to materials that we never dreamt of, you know, we have to send them for a picture and for, for a video, all is there today. I think we have to mediate it. This is the thing, this is the limitation, because I think it's very fruitful how to use the sites how to know which sites you don't go to, to give them recommended sites, to give them uh, directions of how you take this information out and make it meaningful. It's not only information, it's actually learning, Wolf. And if we teach them how to take this, um, all what's out there, and to give it a direction that, that they can really learn from it is, is 
I think it's very important. Now, you're talking about this human connection, Michael. I was all the time against um, you know, we have a lot of um, um, courses today that we give online. And for many years, I said, the whole thing of Holocaust education, that it's the teacher there to comfort you when you teach the Holocaust. I mean, this is the whole thing. It's, it's how do you teach the trauma without trauma, without traumatizing your students. And it was always the fact that there's a human being there that is teaching you, that is directing you. And for many years, I said, how will we teach online when they won't have this eye contact with us? I must tell you, we did our first, we have a lot of courses online, but they were more academic. We have our pedagogical first course that we offered a year ago. I must tell you, the dialogues between teachers, the forms, the projects that they're doing online brings me to think differently of what's a human contact already, even with that, and I never believed that I will say it because I was very strong in that. These teachers are committed to Holocaust education. They do the project every week. They know now age appropriate. They know now that uh, you don't do simulations because we discussed it so much in the form and so on and so on. So I think if we mediate it in, 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 in the right way and we're there and we build all our sites there to, to direct what to do with all what's out there, uh, we might, uh, we might I, I, I won't say win at the end, but use this technology in a way that will be what we believe, what um, um, Professor Maru said yesterday, the right way, you know, and maybe you this know, is what we have to do. You know, many years ago, you know, when, people, when technology enters education, there were discussions about the, the fact that there will, no, there, will not, there will be no need for educators anymore. Everything will be done through technology. Luckily, all these ideas didn't uh, prove itself, and I think what, what is correct is that it's not that the role of the, of, the, of the educators not only changes, it becomes even more and more important because there are less and less uh, interpersonal reaction between agents of socialization and youngsters because they are exposed so, to so many material, knowledge, possible data that is there in the world and the role of educators become so, so important as a mediator between all this world of knowledge and the designing of the internal, I would say, identity of the generation of tomorrow. I want to conclude this uh, session that opens, it's, you know, some, we, we got some answers, but I think I've, I, I feel that I've many questions raised out of this discussion, listening to this, our partners, and I would like to read a short, very short poem that was written by Wislava Szymborska that passed away, you know, prize Nobel uh, poet, poem that passed away last year, a few months ago, and I think it has to be with us. I will read it first in Hebrew and then in English. So excuse me, our English speakers, I think it's worth listening to the words in Hebrew as well. Kafa Yad, 27 atzamot, 35 shririm, karov le alpaim ta'e atzabim, yesh bechol karit shel etzbeotenu hachamesh. Harei ze dai veoter, kede lichtov et mein kampf, o et puadov. And now in English. 27 bones, 35 muscles, about 2,000 nerve cells in each of our five tips of our fingers. That suffice to write Mein Kampf and House of the Poor Corner. And I think it is our responsibility as educators, you know, to teach young generation to write the right books. Thank you very much. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the world.